Hi, I'm Tim Kilduff, and this is HCAM's Business Matters, uh, a discussion with interesting people who do interesting things who live in Hopkinton. And uh, we've, we've uh, got one of those people, we've identified one of those people this morning, and that's uh, Matt Calloran. I asked Matt the title of, uh, of the company which he has uh, just started, what his title is uh, for Redline Gear, and your answer was? It's everything from janitor to web guy to co-founder to CMO. Well, you know, the, the, I think it's fascinating the line of work that you've chosen, uh, you have chosen now to, to branch into. But what we, what we want to do is explore a little bit about your background, which I think is interesting. And I think the, the, the HCAM audience will find it uh, interesting as, as well. How did you get to this point where you decided to start uh, Redline Gear? So let's go back a little bit. All right. Uh, you How far back go, do you want to go? Well, you don't have to go back to when you were born. Okay. But you know, your, your education background might be a good place to start. Sure. I attended Boston College, graduated into, in 1999, and from then got right into the brand development, brand marketing, product development world. Uh, I moved out to Ohio and worked for Abercrombie and & Fitch. And was, during my time there, I was one of the first five people to launch the Hollister stores chain. So this was back when there were four Hollister stores. And today, I believe there are six, 700 of them. Um, so that was, that was how I really cut my teeth on the apparel, product development, brand building world. Um, then I moved back to Boston. My wife and I are, grew up around here and wanted to be closer to family and um, spent eight years at Reebok. So continuing in the similar industry of building brands and working on product, but this time going from the fitness, or sorry, the lifestyle uh, product at Abercrombie to performance and fitness product at Reebok. Uh, working on licensed hats, jerseys, back when Reebok had the NFL, NBA, NHL, and MLB uh, franchises. Um, and then after eight years working at Reebok, I left and went to Hasbro um, and worked on a variety of toy brands, starting with Nerf and Super Soaker and Laser Tag. Um, I spent some time on the games brands, working on Monopoly and Trivial Pursuit, Connect Four, Candyland, all the amazing games that everybody grew up with. And then uh, most recently, I was running the um, Challenger brand portfolio. And so the brands that are just under the franchise brands. So these are the up and coming, either newer brands like a, a um, Littlest Pet Shop or kind of a reinvented brand like an Easy Bake Oven or a uh, Furby or For Real Friends. Well, we're going to talk about Easy Bake Ovens. Oh, Easy this Bake is, Oven. Before this is, uh, this is over. Did we, did, uh, were you an athlete in college? I have always been an athlete to a, a certain level. Um, I didn't play sports in college. Um, BC being a Division I school, it's right, a, a right. huge commitment, as well as obviously uh, you, know, you have to, be, have to be at a top caliber level. Um, I considered playing tennis, but decided that instead I wanted to focus on school and social life and not kind of dedicate all of my time to, a, to being a Division I athlete. You know, that's an uh, interesting uh, line of discussion considering uh, the kids who have just graduated from Hopkins High School who are venturing off and have to make those kind of decisions. Those are pretty, those are pretty serious. They may not yeah. think it is, but those are where, you, where you place your time and effort is, is important. Yeah, my wife, Laura Thompson, played uh, Division I softball. She played at Boston College. And so while we were dating all throughout college, I, I witnessed firsthand what it was like to be a Division I athlete. And there's the amazing pros of having the, the fantastic team, the coaching, the structure, having the experience of, of being on a team. But it definitely is a major commitment. What, what was your focus uh, as an undergraduate, your fo area of study? So I was a little, a little, did things a little backwards. I was in the school, of the College of Arts and Sciences, but I was an economics major. So I should have been in the business school, but I stayed in the arts and sciences school so that I was able to continue to take a lot of the traditional arts and science classes as well as business classes versus being specifically focused on having to take all the business courses. Um, so I was an economics major and a marketing minor. Did that, did, how did that tee you up to go to work for Amber Crabby? Uh, I didn't. 
Well, no, it did. Um, I actually put off the decision of what I wanted to do with my life as long as possible. I was, loved Boston <laughs> College, and I had friends who were getting positions at PricewaterhouseCoopers or in the accounting space in end of sophomore year, beginning of junior year. And as I approached the second semester of my senior year, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. And it literally came down to some connections, some friends, and um, a family friend worked out at Abercrombie in Columbus, Ohio. And there was no way I was moving to Ohio. I grew up in Connecticut, went to school in Massachusetts. But it was going to be a good <laughs> learning experience to go and spend a, uh, a, a few days out in Ohio getting grilled with multiple back-to-back -back interviews and being able to get the experience of what it was like. Um, so I flew out to, to Ohio, as I said, with zero plans yeah. that I would ever move to yeah. Ohio. And next thing I knew, I was. Uh, my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and I both were uprooting from Massachusetts and heading out to the Midwest. And yeah, Columbus at that point was sort of on the upswing. Oh, yeah. It? it still is. It's, a, it's amazing what goes on in Columbus. And you've got the hub of many companies, the whole Les Wexner from Victoria's Secret, um, Bath and Body Works, Lane Bryant, Abercrombie & Fitch, Limited to, um, there, those all started there. Um, and there's just a ton of business. And then when you have Ohio State University, that yeah. alone yeah. is basically its own little city. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So transition then to the, to the, the next job. The it, next? The next phase, the next uh, challenge at, at, at Reebok. So I left Reebok to go to get a new challenge at, at Hasbro. I spent eight years at Hasbro, and I've always had an entrepreneurial bug. I've always really wanted to, to run my own brand. Um, a college friend, buddy from Boston College, um, started posting on Facebook in 2015 these t-shirts with red line logo. And um, he was an insurance salesman. And so I reached out to him. I hadn't talked to him for a little while. And reached out and said, what are you doing? And he said, well, you know, I started doing CrossFit. I had this really cool idea for a brand. And so I started making some t-shirts. And I had my background at Abercrombie and, and Reebok, so I started asking, you know, do you have any designers helping you? Do you have technical people? Do you have a quality control process? And he kind of laughed and said, I'm literally sketching things on a napkin, taking a picture with my iPhone, sending the photos of my drawings to a, uh, a screen printer, and they're creating the files and making the t-shirts and sending them to me. I said, okay, well, that's, that's an interesting way to do it, but not necessarily the best way to do it. And so this was back in 2015. Yeah, 2015. I said, you know, you need my help. And he said, absolutely, let's do it. <laughs> and so nights and weekends for a couple years, I helped with bringing on some friends from, from my former lives who could actually kind of standardize things, um, bringing on some factory contacts, helping with website development. And this is all as the sport of CrossFit continued to grow. Um, and so Redline has been rooted in CrossFit, but the, the longer term goal is to expand beyond CrossFit. But based on the fact that we are still so small and are really managing our resources, it's been a really great ride to kind of grow as the sport of CrossFit has grown. You know, most of us don't understand that market uh, and don't, can't appreciate, I think, the size. Uh, yeah, and, you know there are a couple of there. There's a, a what appears to be a very successful CrossFit operation here in Hopkinton. Absolutely, CrossFit Resilience. Yeah, and uh, they seem to be doing a great job. Yeah, but that's here. So how how big is it? When you when you start to look at taking building this brand, uh, building this gear, how did you what what drove you towards CrossFit, and how big is that market? So the market, last I checked, there were two-thirds the number of CrossFit gyms in the U.S. as they were, there are Starbucks. So there wow. are, there are 6,000 and growing of CrossFit gyms or CrossFit boxes. Um, and so the market is growing. And outside of the U.S., there's more than that. So there's close to 15,000 CrossFit gyms around the world um, with the plan of growing to 20,000, with the expectation to grow to 20,000 by 2020. Um, the kind of the birth of Redline was really kind of a chicken and the egg where my, my co-founder, Matt, 
started doing CrossFit. He was a, an athlete at Boston College. He played baseball and football, and so he was a, definitely a, a competitive person who had kind of lost that competitive spirit or the opportunity to really kind of compete and train like he had in college. And when he found CrossFit, he found a place, a community, but also a, uh, a fitness program that really appealed to him. And the brand and the slogan is, is tied back to CrossFit, but it expands beyond it. Um, it's all about pushing yourself to your personal limits. And so the red line is that line that you push yourself to, but you never want to reach or cross over because that's when bad things happen. So it's all about always uh, okay. pushing yourself okay. to the red line. And our slogan is toe the line. And so in anything that you do, it doesn't necessarily have to be CrossFit. It's all about really kind of pushing yourself and doing your best. And the way CrossFit operates, for those who don't know, is there are workouts each day, and they're very scalable, depending on the weights or the movements. And so in one workout, you can have a 21-year-old kid who's lifting 350 pounds and getting a really great workout right next to a 65-year-old grandmother who's lifting 15 pounds and getting a really great workout. And both of them are doing the same workout, but obviously with different weights. And they're both towing the line or pushing themselves to that red line because at the end of that workout, they both are wiped out and feel fantastic because they've gotten a great workout. Even though the individuals, the athletic ability, the um, weights that are being used are completely different. Um, so that's the kind of formation and the, the birth of how Redline and the brand started. You know, I'm interested in, and I want to get, uh, I want to chat with you a little bit about how you develop uh, product for that for that line, but um, I think I'd, I'd, I'm interested in the, uh, talking to you a little bit about. Here's this sort of traditional approach, corporate approach, corporate uh, experiences. Um, some well-known companies. Oh yeah. Um, the, the, the toy experience is is pretty phenomenal. I think the products that you associated with in in in, in your marketing roles and introduced. How do you go from, uh, maybe nowadays it's not fair to say safe, but how do you go from what would be a nice self-contained job, uh, security, all the things that go with working for a big company to saying, you know what, I've done, I've done all that I can do with that. Here's my passion and, I, I, and, and I'm gonna go off and create a line. Right. In a, an extremely competitive field, I would think. It is. It's definitely competitive. So what, what's, the, what's the driving factor? Stupidity. <laughs> I have an amazingly supportive wife. Um, so without, without her, there's no way I would have been able to do it. Um, I've got three kids who are seven, five, and three. So Ooh. it's, it's not, not necessarily the best time to be leaving a comfortable, supportive right. job. Um, but it, I was at a point where I had been at Hasbro for long enough that I needed a change. This was a great opportunity. Plus, we had the, the data. We had run the company for a couple of years really bootstrapping, and we continue to bootstrap. But there's, there was the momentum. There was the, the, the model had been proven out to some extent. And so it kind of was like, all right, if there's a time, then now is to, to jump on it and see what we can do with it. And I always felt like it was the type of thing that if I didn't, I'd always be sitting at my desk in Hasbro or presenting to the big corporate bigwigs right, at Hasbro, right. wondering what would have, how big could we have? And who knows what's going to happen with Redline if it's the next Under Armour or if it's the next XYZ brand that you've never heard of. My goal, obviously, is it's to take so. it somewhere, somewhere to the, the former. Um, but it was all about really kind of taking that chance, taking the risk for a period of time to see how big we could take it. And, um, you know, I had the experience with three great Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I also had the experience of three great Fortune 500 companies. So I understood and saw the frustrations, the politics, the process, which has to be in place for multi billion dollar companies. And at times it, it wears on you and at times it gets frustrating when the, the freedom and the flexibility to really make decisions and drive the brand isn't always there. 
And a lot of time it's from a legal perspective for the safety of the company to make sure that nothing ends up happening that could be detrimental to the brand. Whereas here, if I put out a social media post, I don't have nine different layers from PR, global team, regional team, agency team, um, legal team to review it before it can be posted and each person has their own little tweak or saying and so by the time it, it gets posted it ends up feeling like it's coming from a big corporation versus feeling like it's a, a, a brand that can relate to the consumer and is talking to them in the, the specific way that they want to be talked to. You know, you, you, t you use the word risk, but uh, it, it seems to me that it's, that it, it's somewhat calculated. I mean, you, you knew the numbers, you had the experience, you knew the numbers, you, you uh, analyzed the, the market, uh, and you've done, there was a lot of work that went into this yeah. before, before, you, uh, before you launched. And the other thing that's interesting is that um, I would think you've got to have a team at home. That, that supports this because you know I watch Shark Tank and uh, and I see the commitments that some entrepreneurs make. It's uh, it's substantial. It is, yeah, it is. I mean, the flexibility is great to one end where I can now bring my kids to to school and camp, and I don't have to be at a meeting in Providence, Rhode Island at 8 a.m. But at the same time, most nights I'm up until. 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning catching up. And that's, that's what I love about it because I can be flexible. And back in my previous life, Laura and I would both have, there were days we would both have a meeting at 8 a.m. And we have three kids to juggle and get out of bed, get dressed, get fed, get to school, and then get to a meeting in time. And so there was a lot of stress. Um, and so now there's just, in some ways, there's a different kind of stress. Yeah. Would you, could you, share with us uh, an example of how you uh, developed uh, you, you develop a product uh, not so much introduce it but develop it with against the backdrop of the competition uh, so it's interesting with the competition you you touched on this before and I after working at Reebok and Hasbro there's definitely the pros of a big company but there's also the challenges especially from the, the flexibility and the, the ability to bob and weave and adjust with the market. And the way the world is going, it's a lot more about customization, personalization, smaller brands. Consumers are kind of not rebelling, but rebelling from the big corporate brands. And you're seeing this in craft beer and craft coffee. Good point. And all these upstart craft apparel right. brands. So you've got Nike, you've got Budweiser, you've got Starbucks, which are always going to be successful and they need to continue from quarter to quarter to show their numbers and figure out how to grow. But the consumer, especially the millennial consumer, doesn't want to be vanilla and doesn't want to be just like everybody else. And this is trickling down. And so every kid doesn't necessarily want to have a Nike swoosh on them. And as these sports, specific to us, as these sports, our niche sports are evolving, the communities and the athletes in those sports are looking for brands that are creating product and talking to them. Um, when I worked at Reebok, across the eight years, Reebok was the performance brand for the NFL and the NBA. Right. Reebok was a hip-hop brand doing Jay-Z and 50 Cent shoes. They were a skateboarding brand doing DGK skateboard. They were a women's fitness brand doing step aerobics. Reebok was and continues to, and that's what happens when you get to be an Under Armour or Nike size, you need to continue growing by being, having a, a touch point in all of the different spaces. But as you get into to sports like a CrossFit or Spartan with obstacle course racing or grappling or all of these kind of niche up and coming sports different from your traditional right. football, baseball, basketball, the communities are growing and they're, they're kind of forming into tribes. They're, they're these community <laughs> sports where it's not like you have people going to 24-hour fitness, going to a machine with headphones on. It's 
it's much more than just a specific sport. And so a brand needs to be involved in the conversation in the same way. And so there's a lot of sports where it's tough, where Reebok loses the NFL to Nike and then says, OK, we're going to get into the CrossFit space. And from a business perspective, it makes sense. You've got CrossFit, which has 15,000, 20,000 boxes or gyms. You've got 4 million people who are, are competing or participating in it. But at the same time, you have a CrossFitter who says, wait a second, Reebok, weren't you just the NFL brand? And weren't you just kind of this mm -hmm. casual skateboarding brand? And the way we grew, and I've seen this from my previous life with Little's Pet Shop and with others, is finding influencers, working with people who are seen as kind of the alpha person, the coaches or the owners or the top athletes, the people that any up and coming competitors, athletes, look to for advice on how to do a workout, advice on how to rest and train and stretch, advice on what's the best gear and apparel to wear. So how do you take all of that? Can you, can you give us an example of how, that, uh, how all of that gets translated into a particular product that, that, that you offer? Sure. Well, it's a combination of marketing, communication, and product. Because when the, the story of Under Armour was Kevin Plank hated the cotton t-shirts that he wore when he played football at Maryland. And so he found a better product. And he came out with a compression shirt which no one had been doing. It's really tough these days to find right. that yeah, and to think. say, we're going to do something that Nike or Reebok or Under Armour had never done before. And so that's, it's, that's pretty much that, that's a, a, uh, a real long shot. And so it's all about, OK, we're going to create the best gear from the look, the feel, but also the brand emotional connection of what the, the product stands for. And all of those things wrapped together are going to be what takes the brand from zero to 100 million. Show, us how, you, million. show us how you translate, translated so that. Just a couple examples. The shorts, little details, like there's a six inch seam on the side. So CrossFitters, they run, they jump, they do squats. This seam is so when you're right here, right here. Yep. So as a CrossFitter is wearing a pair of Redline shorts and bends down, the shorts are going to move with them so they aren't going to bunch up and get in the way as Got you're, Got as you're uh, squatting. The material is really heavyweight, so if you're lifting a bar and you're rubbing a bar against your, your, your thighs, it's not going to rip, it's not going to tear. Um, but this, that's just one example because, you know, as I said, it's not just a CrossFit brand. It's expanding beyond. So we have lighter weight board short models, which are um, a more traditional board short style. But they're lighter weight. They're waterproof, water repellent. Um, they have side pockets. Um, but also, as you can see, it's a lot about the, the designs, the details, and the branding. Um, so it really comes down to a combination of great quality product, as well as great partnerships, uh, ambassadors, and marketing to put the whole package together. Another key thing, just to show you, we mentioned CrossFit Resilience. We partner with some of the 6,000 boxes. And this is something that Reebok would never be able to do just because of the size that right. they are. Right. They would have to, from a, a scalability perspective, it wouldn't be possible. But here's a co-branded pair of really cool shorts. that has the Redline logo on it, but it also has the Hopkinton, the, the Hopkinton, the Hopkinton CrossFit. CrossFit Resilience logo on it. Um, so we're doing more and more, like I was saying, with the craft beer, the craft coffee, right. being nimble, being able to move and adjust. And there's a huge business out there with the 6,000 gyms in the US, owners who don't know anything about apparel and don't know about merchandising. And their key focus needs to be delivering the nice, clean gym, great coaches, really good equipment to work out with. Their whole focus isn't, OK, what t-shirts and shorts am I going to produce? Right, and right. so that's another huge opportunity. We've started getting into the custom business, partnering with different gyms. How, how, long, since you, how long have you been in, in business since you, you've made this leap? I left at the end of last year, so wow. just over six wow. months. So six months in, mm -hmm. today, today. What, what's, your, what's the biggest chip? What, you know, the, 
Somebody said this the other day, what keeps you at, at wake, uh, awake at night? But I'm not so sure we want, want you to stay awake at night, but what's, what's today's challenge? Cash is always a challenge. And that's one of the big things moving from a $100, $200 million brand that I was running at Hasbro to this, where I would have millions of dollars on a marketing budget. And when I would do a Facebook marketing campaign or an Instagram marketing campaign, I, it would be tens, fifty, hundred thousand dollars of for a small marketing campaign and here we're spending twenty dollars a day on Facebook targeted ads. Um, and it's always the prioritization of, all right, we've got ten dollars. Are we gonna spend that ten dollars to buy some more equipment or more gear that we know is gonna sell? Are we gonna spend that ten dollars to run a couple ads so that we could get people to come to the site? It's this constant give and take, push and pull, um, which any entrepreneur is always dealing with. You know we're uh we're coming close uh, to our, our time, and um, I want to ask you about how you settled in Hopkinton. I, I, I really, I, I, I ask everybody that. We were in Brookline for 12 years uh, when okay. we came back from Ohio, yeah. and my wife has worked for EMC for almost 15 years. Oh, okay. And so there was always, as we were um, Newlyweds or um, married without kids, living in the city was great. And as we started to have kids, it became more and more of a challenge. Um, and so after we had our second son, uh, my daughter's birthday actually is today. She turned seven today. Um, we um, started looking and figuring out, okay, I was working in Providence. She was working here in Hopkinton, and we lived in Brookline. And so it was extremely inefficient. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just... Everything you hear about Hopkinton is a draw from the schools to the town to the state park. And as we started researching it, we found an amazing house. And uh, literally the first house we looked at, we jumped on it. And it's been such a fantastic experience. We moved here just about four years ago. And so everything from the new HCA, the, the art center to mm. the school system. Mm. My daughter's finishing second grade. My son will be starting kindergarten next year. Um, EMC continues to be, to be fantastic to my wife. Um, so it's just been uh, a really great community. Well, that's another edition of Business Matters. Uh, continue to be amazed by the, the, by the quality uh, of the people that we have living here and the interesting things that, uh, that they do for, for a living. So on behalf of HCAM, your local television station, uh, always doing great things, uh, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.